ready to get into the Word of God? All right, what have we been talking about? Revelation knowledge, amen? Go with me to the book of Matthew. Let's open up the Word. I'm excited about what God's doing in, in our last days, in these days we're living, amen? How about you? Amen. I was just talking to uh, Mark and Joanne, and they were just sharing with me what's going on at Ben's College, uh, that whenever the kids go to, uh, to the chapel time or the church time, that it was overflowing at college of people trying to get in. That's awesome. Whenever young people are trying to hear the Word of God, they're at college, they're interested in the Word of God, they want to know about Jesus, they're asking questions, and the place can't even handle the young people that are going in. Isn't that awesome? Let's give God praise for that. That's awesome. Now, I don't know about y'all, but as I go about my day, I run into people all the time, especially young people, that are full of questions. They really don't know the truth. They don't know the Word of God. And some of them are picking up their Bibles and beginning to read them on their own. And as they're reading it, they don't really understand what they're saying because they don't really know God. And you have to have a relationship with God. You need the Holy Spirit to teach you. Amen? Amen? They can open up the Bible, they say, I don't understand that. Well, ask God to teach you. Ask God to reveal it to you. And just this week, a couple of times, I'm sitting down with young people in their 20s, their early 20s, and they're asking questions. What about this? What about that? What does this mean? And they're reading stuff in the Scripture. One of them asked me, what does it mean that the life is in the blood? What a question. They were reading that in their Bible. It says, the life is in the blood. It says, what does that mean? Well, guess what? If you don't have any blood, you don't have no life. But Jesus Christ poured out His blood on the cross. He gave His life on the cross, and that blood washes away your sin. Amen? I mean, all the way from the beginning, whenever uh, Cain and Abel uh, had their little disagreement, and uh, Cain killed Abel, it says His blood cries out from the ground. Amen? In, in fact, the first commandment was to Adam, what? Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And let me tell you, when you die, your blood is going to be poured out. But Jesus died in your place. Amen. And when we have communion today, when we're going to take the cup, it represents His blood. It's not His blood, but it represents His blood. Amen? Amen. And we take that bread and we break it, it represents His body that was given up for us, broken for us. And we need to have a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. So while we're looking in, in uh, Matthew chapter 16, go to verse 13. This is our scripture that we're going to be teaching off of, our main scripture. It says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So if somebody asks you, Who is Jesus? What would you answer? He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. Do you really know that, or is it just a religious answer? Is it just coming from your head, or is it coming from your heart? Do you really know in your heart? Do you really believe in your heart? Because serving God comes from the heart. Believing comes from the heart. Your heart is your believer, not your head. Amen? So we've got to get rid of reason to a certain degree, and we've got to let faith take over. Amen? So Jesus comes to the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asks his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And what's the next scripture say? They answer all these different answers. And they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Now I can ask you, Who is Jesus? And you say, Well, the Baptists say, the Catholics say, the Pentecostals say, but I want to know, what do you say? And where do you get that information from? Get it from the Word of God, but the Word of God needs to come alive to you. And when the Word of God comes alive to you, it's something called revelation knowledge. We've touched on that already last week. We want to talk more about that today. Because if you don't have a revelation, you'll just repeat what somebody else said. Guys, I want to just warn you all right now. Not everyone that's on television and on the radio is preaching the truth. Do you all realize that? So you need the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, to show you what is truth. You need to discern. And I've learned this. Young people, one of the biggest problems with young men that I've met, they don't discern what's right and wrong, what's God and what's not of God, and we get in trouble, we make wrong decisions. Young ladies do it too. Old ladies and old men do it too. 
We need to discern. And the way to do that is have revelation from God. Amen. Amen? So the next thing he says to them, he says, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And that's the big question. I believe when you're going to stand before God on that day of judgment, he's going to say, who do you say that I am? Well, mama said, no, it doesn't matter what mama said. Daddy said, Pastor Mark said. You know, whenever you hear a teaching and you leave here and you go and, and you're talking to somebody about Christ and, and you tell, well, Pastor Mark said, well, they don't care what Pastor Mark says. You should say the word of God said, or the, you know, because you can find it in the word and you got a revelation of who you are, who he is because of what you read in the word. Amen. So if I can talk you into serving God, somebody can talk you out of serving God. Amen. But whenever God reveals himself to you, nobody can take that away from you. Amen. Now, you can throw it away if you want. But no one can take that away from you. That's called revelation knowledge. When the knowledge becomes real to you, and you know that you know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God. How many of y'all know He's the Messiah? Amen. Now, believing that, is He your Messiah? Is He your Lord? And is He your Savior? Amen. Personally? Amen. Do you really know Him? That's the question. Amen. Or do you just know about Him? See, we, how, how many of y'all know uh, President Obama? No, we know about him, but how many of y'all met him and got to talk to him and really know who he is? That's because you haven't spent time with him. So if you're going to get to know God, you've got to spend time with God. Amen? So I love this. He said, who do you say that I am? And this next answer is the answer. Next scripture, verse 15. Simon Peter, say Peter. Peter. Now Peter was kind of a knucklehead, y'all know that, huh? Yeah, he, he, he was kind of like us by you blunts. You say one thing and you do another sometimes. He said, I'll die with you, Lord. And he denies him three times before the, the uh, sun rises. He has great intentions, but he tries to live for God out of his own strength. And how many of y'all realize you can't do that? You need God to live on the inside of you and show you, teach you, give you grace and mercy to live for him. Amen? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Somebody say, praise God. Let's say that together. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, how many of y'all really believe that? If you really believe that, then you should know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You should know that you know that you know that you know. See, I've got a revelation that if I drop dead right now, I'm going to heaven. Somebody said, that, that's presumptuous. You can't, you can't know that. You can by revelation of God's Spirit. Now, religion can tell you something else. I'm not waiting to die to find out where I'm going. I want to get my, myself settled right now. And I believe in the Lord. Amen. You know, I didn't choose him. He chose me. That's what the Bible said. I was going about my life. I was doing my own thing. How I many I was doing the same thing? Going about doing your own thing. Even if you was religious, you might have went to church every now and then to check it off the box to make your mom and dad feel good, make your conscience feel good. But you didn't really know him. You was just doing the little church thing. But one day... You lay your head down on that pillow at night to go to sleep, and you're thinking, there's more to life than this. There's more to life than, than running the rat race. Amen? And, and you begin to seek. You begin to ask. And then God reaches out, and in your lifetime, He grabs you and chooses you. And He begins to reveal Himself to you because you're seeking Him while He may be found. How many of y'all are seeking God? Now just think, all of these young people that are going to college, why is that chapel filling up? They're seeking God. Amen. This is so different than what we've heard of for the last 20 years, where when, when children leave the church and they go to college, they forget everything about God and they just go do their own thing and they, they listen to all the liberal teachers out there that, that teach that it's just evolution, there's no God, that if you believe in God, it's, you're in a delusion. Now they're saying, you know what? Forget about what they're teaching. I'm seeking to know something more. Amen. How about us? Are you seeking to know more? Amen. Whenever we quit seeking, guys, we, we get stagnant. Amen. You can be a Christian for 20 years and be stagnant right now because you're not seeking to know him more, Amen. to know more about him. Amen. So the answer was right here. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now look at this next scripture. And Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon, bar Jonah means son of Jonah, 
For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, I'm flesh and blood, okay? But the words that I'm speaking to you, they're spirit and they're life if they're coming from the Word of God. So what's happening, whenever I begin to speak the Word of God, which is spirit and life, your spirit bears witness to the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and you begin to agree with it and it changes your life. I'll be honest with you, without revelation knowledge, without the Father revealing something to you from heaven, you're not learning anything. You're just getting information. You're getting your head full of stuff. And you can read all the books you want. You can listen to all the tapes you want. You can watch all the television you want, Christian television. You can listen to all Christian music. But if you don't get a revelation from God about who Jesus Christ is, you're still lost. So I love this. Peter and all the rest of the disciples that are there with him, they've been with Jesus. They saw him heal the sick. They saw him raise the dead. They saw him do all these great miracles, feed 5,000 people with a few fish and loaves. They saw all these great things. And, And Jesus says to Peter, you didn't figure this out from flesh and blood, but my Father who is in heaven is the one that's revealed this to you. Now read it again. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed, given you this revelation knowledge. But my Father, who is in heaven, and I want to just add this, has revealed this to you. Now go to the next verse. Look at this scripture. And I also say to you that you are Peter. And it says, upon this rock of the revelation of who I am, that's what he's talking about, upon this rock of you knowing from the Father in heaven that I'm the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And last week I told you the word Christ and Messiah is the same word. They use Messiah in the Hebrew Old Testament, and they use Christ in the New Testament in the Greek. It represents the exact same word. It means the same thing. When they're saying Christ, they're saying Messiah. When they're saying Messiah, they're saying the Christ. Amen? So he's saying, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the one that God has called to to redeem the world in Israel. And so he says, blessed are you, Simon. And then he gets right here and says, I'll I'll also say to you, Peter, he says, upon this rock of the revelation of who I am, I will build my church. Who's building the church? We looked at this last week. Let's go over it again. Who's building the church? Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In other words, when you get a revelation of who you are and who he is, the devil can't steal that away from you. The gates of hell can't take that away from you. And you know what the devil wants you to do is doubt that Jesus Christ is is Lord, that he's the Messiah. See, some people are taught once you get saved, everything's going to be all right. How many of y'all figured that out? It doesn't work that way. That once you got saved and believed in Jesus, you entered into a war. And you have armor that you're supposed to be putting on. As you fight this war. So once you have this revelation that comes from heaven. And there's many revelations. You can read a scripture 20 times. And one day you're going to be reading it. And it's going to jump out at you. And you're going to get a new revelation of what that scripture means. Isn't that amazing? Because the Holy Spirit's the teacher. How many of y'all believe the Holy Spirit's the teacher? Not Pastor Mark, but the Holy Spirit in me and in you. So don't just listen to me. Listen to him as I speak. So I love this. After service or during the week, I'll run into some of you. He says, when I was sitting at church, I thought you was just talking to me, Pastor. Well, God was just talking to you. It wasn't me. God knows where you are, knows what you need to hear. And if you be listening for God, you'll hear God. So the gates of hell will not prevail against this revelation you have, against the church. In fact, you cannot be a member of the church until you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's how you become part of the, the body of Christ. And just to to kind of review, last week we went to Peter and it says that Jesus is a living stone and upon that foundational stone, the chief cornerstone, we are also living stones that are being placed upon that rock to become a spiritual house to worship God. So the spiritual house is not this building, it's us. God dwells in us. Where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of us. He does not dwell in temples made with human hands. You can make a box and say God's in that box. God's not in that box. Guess where God is? Right here. You can build a statue and God's not in that statue. Amen? 
In fact, as the scripture says, a man takes a, a tree, cuts it down, takes the wood, some of it, builds a fire to cook, takes another part of the wood and makes an idol and worships the idol. He's worshiping a piece of wood that has eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, and a mouth that cannot speak. But the Apostle Paul lets us know in the New Testament that when you bow down to an idol to worship it, you are bowing down to what? Demons. Because if you give it power, then it has power in your life. Guys, y'all don't want to believe in superstition. Amen. Who was here when I did the sermon, when I took a ladder, I opened the ladder, I opened an umbrella, and I walked through the, under the ladder with the umbrella and broke a mirror, I think, all at the same time. I'm still here. <laughs> Superstition. If you give something power, then it has power in your life. Come on, let me tell you something. Somebody that d dabbles in witchcraft and sorcery and psychics, they can't put a curse on me. I'm blessed. Amen. Come on, they can't put a curse on me. I'm blessed. Say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Amen. So don't be believing in all that kind of stuff because if you believe in it, then it has power in your life. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Or as you believe in your heart, that's what it's going to be to you. Amen. Somebody can say, I'm going to put a curse on you. You can't. Amen. Not unless I believe you can. Amen. We give the devil too much power. In fact, it says, these signs will follow them that believe. The first thing he says, they will cast out devils. Once you get born again, you've got authority over all the power of the enemy. Amen. What's the next scripture say? And he says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, he's going to give these keys to everyone who believes, not just to Peter. This is for everyone that believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You've got keys. You've got power. You've got authority. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. He says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen. How many of y'all, when you pray and you take authority over the enemy? Amen. How many of y'all, when you pray and you ask God to release his angels so they'll go do something for you? You don't, have to, you don't talk to the angels. Tell God to release them. Amen. We pray to God. We talk to God. We don't talk to angels or demons. Now, if one shows up and wants to talk to me, I'll challenge him and says, tell me about Jesus Christ, because that's what the Bible says, test every spirit. Amen? Amen. But most of us, uh, through superstition, we believe in aberrations. When Jesus shows up, he's not going to be an aberration. You're going to be able to touch him. You'll be able to eat fish with him, like he did with his disciples. When he appeared to his disciples, he said, handle me, touch me, put your hand here. He was flesh and bone. He was not a, a ghost. Amen? Amen? So if some kind of ghost appears to you, just rebuke it. Amen? I know people have all kinds of experiences. Let it line up with the Word of God. That's what you need to do. Let it line up with the Word of God. I want you to go with me to uh, Acts chapter 4. Acts 4, 7. Peter just finished healing a man at the temple gate. He was begging for silver and gold. He reached out to the man. He said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the man who was lame from his mother's womb was from birth was made whole. He leaps and he dances and he goes. And, and so the Sanhedrin and the religious people get upset because there's power following the disciples. And after they have captured Peter and, and, and the disciples, verse 7 says this, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? How did this miracle take place where this lame man walked, is what they're asking Peter. And I love verse 8. Listen. Then Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel. So he's talking to the leaders of their religion. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to the helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel 
that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, let's make it clear who it is, Jesus the Messiah from Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. He just preached the death, burial, and resurrection to them again. And he looked right at him and says, you're the guys that crucified him and God raised him from the dead. It's in his name. And let me tell you, Peter knows that he's treading on, on uh, you know, dangerous ground because they, they want to kill anyone that's preaching in the name of Jesus. But because he was full of the Holy Spirit, not in his own strength, he wasn't afraid anymore. When you get full of the Holy Spirit, you'll do su supernatural things. You'll do things you wouldn't do in your own flesh. You'll give up some things when you're full of the Holy Spirit. You'll follow the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. He says, uh, where was I? Let it be known, verse 10. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him this man stands before you whole. Listen, we studied this last week. You can get last week's tape. We're kind of building on it. He says, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders. So he's talking to the leaders, to the high priests and those that crucified Christ. He said, which has become the chief cornerstone. So the foundation, and if we look back at, uh, at uh, Matthew chapter 16, is not Peter, it's Jesus. Jesus is the foundational rock. He's the chief cornerstone in which everything is measured and built off of. Amen? Amen. Now, verse... 12, I love this. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. What's that name? Jesus. Jesus. Whoever calls upon his name shall what? Amen. Be saved. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's one Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come unto the Father except through him. Amen. There's no other way to God. So Jeremiah, or like you said, uh, one of the prophets, he's not one of those. He's the Messiah. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can get saved any other way but by him. Go with me to 1 Peter. I mean 1 Timothy, chapter 2. Look with me at verse 3. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. When you get there, say praise the Lord. It says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants us to get the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And he's going to tell us what that truth is. This is a good thing right here. This is what God wants. He desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Look at verse 5. For there is one God... And one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. How many mediators between God and man? One. There's one God and one mediator between God and man. And I love it. It says, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So whenever we start believing that there's another mediator or we can go to God another way, we cannot go to God another way. Amen. God, it sounds very uh, narrow-minded whenever I say there's only one way to God and it's Jesus Christ. We have a lot of religions in the world. We've got Muslims, we've got all kinds of different religions. But the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. He is the Messiah, and we need to have that revelation, and we need to preach that to other people so that they can come to the same revelation that you have, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If they don't, they will be lost. If they reject Him as Messiah, they will be lost. We have a job to do. We're to go out and tell people about Jesus Christ and what He did for us. Go with me to first, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're building up to something here. Y'all getting ready? Glory to God. Turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. <laughs> if they're half asleep, now they're half awake. 
Let's start with verse 14 and read this. This is powerful. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. For he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves. Turn to your neighbor and say, you shouldn't be living for yourself. Come on, we don't live for ourselves anymore. But what does it say? But for him who died for them and rose again. I'm living for Jesus. Say that, I'm living for Jesus. Does that, do you, are you really living for Jesus? Fulfilling your purpose. It says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. It says, even though we have judged, we have known Christ according to the flesh, it says, yet now we know him thus no longer. He's alive. He's been raised from the dead. Now, here's a, one of our favorite scriptures we preach on all the time. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, are you in Christ today? Amen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Say all things become new. Things. How many things become new? All. Now, that, that's a little strange because when I got born again, my body didn't seem to get new. But guess what happened? Your body did become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he did say your body is mortal. That means it's going to get older. Your body is apt to die. It's going to die. Amen? Amen? But now you're in a new creation. So it says you have a natural body and you have a spiritual body because you are a child of God. So whenever you die, guess what happens? This old rag just falls off and you get your immortal body, your eternal body, which is in heaven or in the spirit realm. How many of y'all believe these things? Amen. you got to read the Word of God. Amen. All things become new. I became a new person when I got born again. How about you? Amen. I was talking to somebody the other, other day, and we were talking about whenever I was younger, you know, we, we was young, we, we'd shoot birds or whatever. When the first, I can remember the first bird I killed. It smote me. It's like I just took a life of an animal. I just took a life. Now, to some people, it seems silly because I grew up in Bayou Blunt. All these old boys in Bayou Blunt, they were all rough. and They didn't seem to care about anything, you know. And so they, it, it kind of made me feel like I was a little sissy or something because they just kill anything for any reason, like, a, you know, they target practice on birds. But when I had taken that life of that bird when I first killed it, it just smote me. It's like, and I learned, you know, if you're going to kill it, you're supposed to eat it. How many of you have been taught that? Oh, a mockingbird don't taste good. Especially over a little fire you build with some sticks. Get some salt and pepper put on it. But what ended, what ended up happening is that the more I hung around with these, the little gang of boys, the harder I got. The tenderness about life kind of just drifted away. And it was more about being accepted by the people around me. Being tough. How many have bear witness with what I'm saying? But I, and as I got kind of uh, hard-hearted, seared in my conscience, the older I got and the more I hung around with some of these, uh, we'd just target practice with a 22 at bird, just see if we could hit them while they're flying. Now, that's a pretty good shot when you can get a flying bird with a 22 rifle. Okay? And we could do it. I couldn't hit them every time, but it could get it a few times. And it was like, all, you know, that, that tenderness had gone away because the world and and the people of the world, and I didn't know about the gospel. I didn't know about life and how important life was. And I'm saying all this because the day I got born again was so life-changing. Not everyone has that kind of conversion experience like I did. When I closed my eyes and I prayed, and I opened my eyes after that prayer, asking Jesus to be Lord of my life, when I had a revelation of who He was, that He wanted me, that He wanted to exchange His life with me, give me righteousness, holiness, make a covenant with me, and man, I really was like on fire. I really knew Jesus was alive. It wasn't just a religious thing to me anymore. It was a reality to me. It became real because I had revelation knowledge in my heart that Jesus loved me. Amen. And he wanted to give me a brand new start, a brand new life. And I prayed and I closed my eyes. When I opened my eyes, that preciousness of life came back to me instantly. Amen. And I saw the trees and I realized the trees were praising God. The branches are going out. I said, look at that. The trees are even praying. The sky is blue. 
I knew it was blue, but it was blue because God wanted it to be blue. And then the clouds go in and you start seeing God created all of this for me. And whenever I'd go pray in the woods and I'd go pray by a river or go pray by the bayou, birds and ducks, and it was like he'd put a show on for me just to show me that, hey, I see you there. Or when, when the wind would blow on your face, all of a sudden it was like, thank you, Lord, you know I'm here and you're giving me a cool breeze. All of a sudden, everything took on a new meaning. All things became new. And honestly, just, just uh, amen. Some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. And again, to kill something alive, to kill an animal, it took on a whole, I had that tenderness again like I was when I was a little boy. Unless you become converted like a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Because the world will make you hard. Amen? There's people in your life that will make you hard. Some of us grew up in families where the men in those families, they thought it was their job to make you hard. Well, they should teach you to be a hard worker, but not be hard-hearted. There's a big difference. All things became new for me. I had that restoration of love for life. Amen? Amen. And then whenever I flipped through the television and I saw starving children, I was moved with compassion that before I would just flip right over and I wouldn't even pay attention to it. Amen? Sometimes to tears. That the only reason I couldn't watch it is because it was smoting my heart so much, so I began to sponsor children. I began to do something. Amen. Not just talk about it, not just hear about it, begin to do something. Look at the next scripture. This says, all things become new. It says, now all things are of God. Say all things are of God. Once you're born again, everything going on, going on in your life, you need to recognize God is doing something. Not just the devil. The devil's trying to knock you off, but God, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen. You can trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, the Bible says. Right. Now everything in your life is of God, and you need to walk with God. And it says, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So what happens when you believe all things are of God and you say, you know what? God reconciled us to himself. Jesus came so that he would restore your relationship with God. When we sin, we're separated from God. So Jesus comes to take the sin out of the way and wants to restore our relationship with God. That's what re reconciliation is. He wants to reconcile us to God through Jesus Christ and wants us to have the ministry of saying to everyone else, you all need to be restored back to God. How do you get restored to God? You believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that takes that sin that has separated you from God out of the way. Right. Now look at this next scripture. He says it clearly. That is, and let me explain to you, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Say the world. God was in Jesus Christ. Christ, God, man. We just read it. The word became flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. God became a man and came to the earth to reconcile us to himself. So it says that God was in Christ reconciling the whole world to himself, not imputing their trespasses or sins. That's the same word. Okay. Trespasses to them, but has committed to us the word of reconciliation. In other words, Jesus Christ came to the earth to take your sin away and he's not holding your sin against you anymore. He has forgiven you. So he's saying, be reconciled to God. Your sin is not the problem anymore. It's what you believe about Jesus is what you've got to deal with. Amen. Be reconciled to God. Amen. I'm forgiven. And it says the world. He says, Christ came to reconcile the world to himself. But not all of the world is going to be saved. Because they don't receive the ministry of reconciliation. Not imputing, not accounting, not holding my sin against me. Whenever I got born again, that was one of the main things that was in my mind. When I was giving my life to Christ, I realized all my sins were going to be forgiven. I was an excited man. Amen. 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 And you know, as we live with Him, even when we still sin, we can confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us Amen. from all unrighteousness and restore us back to righteousness. So guess what the message is to the whole world? When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and accept Him as for who He is, God's not going to hold your sin against you anymore. 
Isn't that what the Word of God says? Not imputing, not accounting, not holding their trespasses or their sins against them, but it's committed to us the word of reconciliation. So I need to go out today, and you need to go out today and tell everybody, listen, y'all can be restored to God. God's not holding your sin against you. Amen. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It matters what you believe today. Look at the next scripture. It says, now then, we are ambassadors. I'm an ambassador. How y'all like my ambassador suit? It's a spiritual suit. It's not what you wear on the outside. Amen? It's not your clothes. It's what you believe. It says, so it says now we are ambassadors for Christ. How many of you know what an ambassador is? It's a person that represents another kingdom or a king, a king in his kingdom, and you're, you're in a different place. Like an ambassador for the U.S. can be, you know, in, in uh, Korea. And they represent all the authority, all the power, all the laws of the land of the U.S. And they're in another land. Well, guess what? I represent all the power, all the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. And I'm in another land called the earth. Amen. And I have His power, His authority, and His word. And I'm supposed to be speaking that everywhere I go. Amen. Wow. Not, uh, it says, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though Christ, uh, God were pleading through us. And guess what? God is pleading through me Amen. and through us. We employ you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So when you see somebody in trouble, you need to just say, you know what? God restored me, and He'll restore you. I represent His kingdom, I represent Him. Be reconciled to God. He's not holding your sin against you anymore. 